Welcome, Joseph Ledoux. Thank you so much for coming back to the Science of Psychotherapy and having another chat with us, because uh, there's, there's always something fantastic you've got to say. How are you well, going? Thank you, Richard. I'm doing fine. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, you're still producing wonderful stuff. I mean, I, I've never been more Despite excited. my age, I'm still uh, occasionally <laughs> turning something. <laughs> Despite my age. Yeah, yeah you, you're still pumping out stuff. And, and I must admit, you, it really excited me. And, and actually, I was looking at something the other day, back in 2014, where you were saying, uh, actually, it's my fault. I've got myself into this problem where I, I call, uh, you know, fear, the amygdala fear. And, and these elements... And people are still getting it. So I thought we'd go into that stuff. We'd go okay. into sort of consciousness, emotions, where they come from. And uh, maybe you might even like to start talking about this brand new paper that you've uh, just brought up, the mnemonic basis of subjective experience. Uh, sure. If you yeah. wouldn't be so kind. Well, yeah, this is a paper that um, I wrote with uh, my good friends and collaborators, Hakwan Lau, Matthias um, Michel, and Steve Fleming, and we're all in, in Hakwan is in Japan, Steve is in London, and Matthias right now is in, uh, in Paris, but um, he has been working at NYU in the philosophy department. And the, the paper is really about the overlooked importance of memory and consciousness. You know, we, we see, you know, things in our world nonstop all the time when we're awake, and they have meaning for us because we've learned what they mean. We don't come into the world knowing what books and apples and uh, TVs are. We have to learn all that stuff. Um, and we store that as memory. And then we use those, those stored templates to uh, make sense of the things we encounter in life. So that's how our, you know, our explicit conscious awareness comes about, our you know, the, our experiences that have content, oh, that's an apple, or that's a snake, or uh, that's a, a building. Um, we, have, we have knowledge about what those things are, and without that knowledge, those things are just abstract entities out there in the world. So we have to, every time we see one, we have to, like, apply that knowledge to make sense of it, because, you know, no two apples are the same, right? But mm. they all kind of conform close enough to make it seem like, you know, that's an apple. It feels like you're seeing an apple when you see an apple. But if you saw a purple apple, something would be a little off, right? You would kind of have to stop and think about it a bit because you don't usually see purple apples. So in this paper and in uh, stuff that Hakwan and I have written about and that will also be a major part of this new book I'm working on, um, the idea is that Throughout our life, we are acquiring information. Our brain is, is, every neuron in the brain is acquiring information every moment of the day and night. Because all neurons know is synaptic input from other neurons or chemical, you know, um, diffusion onto those neurons. That's all they know about is their inputs. And yet they accumulate over time important aspects of who we are. So, you know, you could think of your, you know, this is a kind of popular pop psych idea now, but uh, deep learning, right? So you can think of your brain as basically a deep learning computer. It's acquiring information all of the time in a very procedural, unconscious, or at least um, uh, not explicitly conscious way. It's more, you know, a kind of um, uh, awareness by, how shall I say it, uh, acquaintance or familiarity, where it's not really hit you over the head consciousness. It's just like there's this awareness that, that everything is okay. William James called this a feeling of rightness. And um, this is a big topic in science today is the feeling of rightness of things. Because when something doesn't feel right, that triggers kind of cognitive dissonance, which you then have to come up with a, an explanation for a narrative or something that will help you make sense of that thing that doesn't feel right, like a, a purple apple. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's purple, but but yeah, it's, it's basically an apple. So you don't usually have to go through that kind of machination, but when you find something that violates the norms, then you have to kind of you know step in cognitively interpret it. But all of this procedural knowledge is allowing you 
to feel like you are the person having that experience mm -hmm. or that it's your body that is it participate in this in this activity. And we only know that's important from people who have damage in various parts of the brain that lose this ability to know that their mental states or their body states belong to them. They feel that, you know, that this is not me that is having these thoughts. These are not my thoughts in psychosis, for example. Or this is not, you know, I feel that pain, but it's not my, I don't feel like it's in my body. You know, it's like, it's there, but it's not me. Um, so it puts into relief the importance of this sort of baseline, low level feeling of rightness, fringe consciousness, penumbra of consciousness that James talked about that is there implicitly, or shall we say tacitly, yeah. because it's not implicit, it's tacit. It's there, but you never have to like bring it into your mind. So every conscious state with content um, for example, the apple or your awareness that uh, uh, you see your your wife or your friend and you're just happy to see them and you know you're happy to see them. But a lot of that underneath it is that tacit awareness that that's right to see them, that it's them. So if something looks a little different, you see your wife, you know, with her arm around somebody, all of a sudden that's, you know, that's not right. <laughs> and so you have to now start to deal with that cognitively. So all of this stuff is like, under the surface, you know, we, we know we have two kinds of memory, explicit and implicit. And implicit, explicit memories are based on semantic or episodic memory. Uh, these are semantic memory is facts about the world. Episodic memory is um, uh, consciousness. Uh, episodic memory is memory about yourself and your past experiences and your expectations about the future and so forth. So these have explicit content. But procedural memories have no content because they're unconscious, or so it's said. But I think that that's not quite true. Mm. You know, episodic and semantic memory are well-defined categories with well-defined brain systems. Procedural memory is a grab bag concept. As everything that's not episodic and, proced uh, not episodic and semantic is procedural. Yeah. And so it's just everything else. And every system in the brain, even the conscious and, and cognitive ones, undergo procedural kind of learning. So I think what's going on is that th because it's such a diverse concept, procedural learning, that it covers so much, it's possible that there are degrees of unconsciousness or degrees what, of what I call tacit consciousness um, that separate the truly procedural, the truly unconscious things like reflexes, conditioned reflexes, um, or habits, things that you just roll off without you know, any awareness, and you can't cognitively access the mechanisms or the processes involved. Um, but this tacit awareness, you can turn your attention to and be aware of it. You know, like if I say, you know, is this me having that thought? Of course, it's me having that thought. Uh, I can like address that because I know what it feels like to be me. But when it doesn't feel like it is to be me, like to see the purple apple or to see my wife with her arm around somebody, that would be, you know, that would kind of like rise above the surface and cause me to have to cognitively evaluate and, and reconstruct and, and rethink the whole process for your praise. So um, that's what this paper is about. Uh, it's a, primarily about these implicit processes that color our perceptions, our thoughts, our memories, and so forth, um, including our conscious, our more explicit conscious thoughts, perceptions, and memories, um, because this, this feeling that William James talked about, this kind of fringe consciousness, uh, this feeling of rightness, this penumbra of consciousness, um, is always there, and um, you can turn your attention to it, but it's on the edge, and so it's not quite explicit. It's just kind of unconscious. And it makes our explicit conscious states have that warmth and familiarity and acquaintance that, that you know that we have because those are our states. Yeah. I mean the the beauty of looking at this idea of uh, uh, you know this tacit idea as different from implicit so stuff that has become that is not not knowable at the time by the way the the, the paper that you're asking about doesn't have this tacit in it this is in the in my that's book. In a, that's another stuff yeah 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 but 
but it's because it, there's that sense of, uh, and I wrote about it in, in one of my books. I said a, a client comes in, sits in the room and says, I'm not okay. And then you do some stuff and then they say, I am okay. And you stop therapy. Um, yeah, that's a good old, I'm okay. You're okay. <laughs> yeah. And, and the, the question is, how do they know? Um, and of course, I this thing, of, this thing of rightness, and and so there's, um, am I right in saying there's 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 learnt rightness? So there's there's learnt things like you you learn that red is an appropriate colour for an apple, and your wife probably shouldn't be walking down the street, uh, you know, uh, with somebody else, and so on and so forth. Uh, but there's also uh, is there an innate set of um, preferences? Uh, like you know, do we desire to be? I, I suggest we desire to be well. Is that a, is that a reasonable sort of assumption? Well, desire is kind of a loaded term, right? It yeah, kind of puts a, a lot of subjectivity into yeah. it. And with this rightness stuff, it's just there. There's no, it, it's not the, uh, it's not like so explicit as to be a desire. I think we could say we could have an unconscious desire, but, yeah. but genetically, let let's talk about that because yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know, let's take emotions. Let's take fear. I and only I can have the experience of fear that I have because my experience of fear is based on what I've learned fear to be in my life. Now, some of the baseline from which I start is going to be my generic genetic heritage uh, because, you know, we can think of our neurons and in, in our brain as being kind of bell curves, right? Each neuron is a bell curve. And so you put a bunch of bell curves together in one part of the brain, and that becomes a brain area uh, that might have, com, might participate in some function because of its synaptic connectivity. Um, <clears throat> so the, the sum of what that area does, for example, the amygdala detecting responding to danger, the sum of that process in me is going to be different from the sum of that process in you because we have different genes that have wired our amygdala's bell curves differently, and because we've acquired different information over the course of our life about what's dangerous and what's not. So um, in terms of the sheer, flat, automatic, Pavlovian conditioned response, uh, which is going to be a summation of you know genetic and non-genetic, learned epigenetic, all kinds of things that come together in an implicit way to produce a response, that is pure implicitness. Mm -hmm. But that, in, that amygdala implicitness can be propagated to cortical areas. For example, if we think of uh, two kinds of, of cortical areas that might be important for this kind of thing, one would be the lateral prefrontal cortex, which is the, the, the newer part of the prefrontal cortex on the outside of on each, in each hemisphere that is involved in working memory and cognitive uh, metacognition and all kinds of fancy cognitive processes. And on the medial side, inside, like imagine a hot dog bun, you pull it apart, the, the white yeah. untoasted part on the inside is the medial part, and the brown part on the outside is the lateral part. So the white toasty part there is older. Uh, all mammals have that same white toasty stuff. You know, it's a little, it's going to be different in, in monkeys than in rats and different in humans than in monkeys, but we've all got the same basic structures. But with the lateral prefrontal cortex, monkeys have parts that rats don't have, and humans have parts that monkeys don't have. Mm. So that's kind of like an evolutionary expansion through from for, through mammals from uh, so-called lower mammals or non-primate ma primate mammals to to primates to human primates. The where they're different. That doesn't mean we're the pinnacle or the, the end point of some grand scheme of of uh, development because we we ain't so great a lot of the time. We do a lot of bad stuff. You know, <laughs> humans are, are you know. A piece of work, like what's happening in the Ukraine and well, things yeah. we do in this country. Yeah, there's some people that sort of say we're, we're one of the only species with this level of consciousness and communication and so on and so forth. So maybe the other species uh, have wise. <laughs> <up. laughs> yeah. So, you know, I think uh, so these two kinds of uh, parts of the cortex are important because that medial older part that is shared by all mammals, I think, is getting that amygdala signal. And representing it, yeah, and it's representing it in that in a way that if you direct work lateral cor prefrontal cortex attention, working memory to that state, you can be aware of it. 
but ordinarily it doesn't like get in the way. It's just kind of there. There's a there's a philosopher named I think it's Magnum, uh, Bruce Magnum. Uh, I forget how to spell it exactly, but um, I've been reading him, and he says that um, um, you know working memory is very high on articulation. The, the articulation functions of working memory are very energy demanding, right? So to be able to have information in a form that you can consciously talk about and process and, and you know, pr make predictions from and so forth, this deliberative cognition uh, takes a lot of energy. So we don't use that unless we really need it, right? So we, we do as much with as little as possible to get through any given situation. So you got reflexes and automatic responses that get you through most of the day. Sometimes you have to cognitively create a mental model to make a prediction. You can do that unconsciously, or you can do it consciously. Uh, and once, why do we have consciousness if we can do it unconsciously? Well, consciousness opens up a whole new uh, window of information processing, information integration, flexibility of behavioral control, and, and all of those good things. So that conscious awareness feels right because of that medial prefrontal cortex representation of that amygdala state. So yeah, rightness in this case is it, that feels like fear. That's Rightness doesn't mean good or bad. It's just that it feels normal. So if you have that feeling of fear consciously, uh, it's your your prefrontal your medial prefrontal cortex getting information, say from the amygdala, is, and from your body states and so forth, is providing your your con, your explicit consciousness with a feeling that you want, you know what that is, right? But if all of a sudden there's a snake at your feet and it turns away, you know that. That's, you know, that's not right. That's not what you expect. So you, you now have the sense of relief. So this rightness and wrongness isn't good or bad. It's just like what's normal and what's not, what's expected and what's not. And based on expectation violation, that's when we bring in additional resources to cognitively anticipate. We can deal with a snake without any of that, right? We freeze, we run away. We don't need to, to have consciousness and cognition and predictions. We just do what you know, our Pavlovian and genetic responses tell us to do, and we're, we're pretty good. In fact, we start thinking too much, we might get into trouble with the snake. Yeah, and, in, and in fact, as you've talked about in some of the other uh, papers and various discussions, those sorts of behavioral responses um, are uh, have their certain aspects of, of wiring and representation. Uh, but just getting back to that thing of the fear, when you're talking the that what you were saying that you're you're as guilty as uh, as any in uh, giving amygdala the being the home of fear, whereas yeah. what you've just clarified there is uh, and what I'll just sort of say it that you talked about it as defensive and survival uh, mechanisms in the amygdala that then comes up into the prefrontal cortex and then is interpreted as you say through through personal experience that that is a fear. Uh, a fear element um right. and, and this is of course allowing for the fact that the brain is is more or less functioning and you're not some kind of psychopath who doesn't get afraid of anything because they right. whatever but so allowing for those pedants out there who are going oh yes but so but that that was an interesting thing also in in talking about this is that we don't have a direct connection uh, a direct connection from the prefrontal cortex back to the amygdala and some of these limbic areas. So that that ability to, that that willful control, uh, who was it, the, the, the metaphor, the, the rider and the elephant, you know, if the, the rider can can tell the elephant to do as much as it likes until the elephant wants to right. do whatever it likes. <laughs> so so this, this sort of difference between uh, what we also talk about, what is it, the higher order representation, but then the higher order representation of the, or the representation of the yeah. higher order representation. Yeah. Uh, how does that, uh, how would, how would a psychotherapist value from understanding what an emotion <clears throat> is trying to tell him? Well, first, let me say that, you know, it's often said that, that emotions, certain basic emotions like fear and disgust and joy and whatever, um, are innate, are innately programmed in us. Uh, this is very popular theory in psychology and neuroscience. Um, but I think that's wrong. What's, what's innate is danger. Um, 
uh, we've all we have acquired through our evolutionary history the ability to detect and respond to danger. Now, part of this innate thing about fear and other emotions is that they're supposed to be universal in all people around the world. But it's not uh, it's not fear that's universal. It's danger. Mm-hmm. Every culture has dangers that its constituents are exposed to. And so they have a word, they have language to describe those experiences. Now we can translate those words, fear into, you know, Frucht or, you know, it's in German, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing it right, but there's a German word for fear. There's a word in, in every language for fear. So we, we think because we can translate fear, the word fear into all these different languages, the experience is the same. But we know from lots of psychology research that uh, cultural differences and emotional experiences are quite varied and quite different. Mm. So we each have our own personal understanding of fear because we've developed what's called an emotion schema that when in a situation of danger, we kind of pattern complete uh, the experience of being afraid because we have a template on which to uh, model that experience. Um, so we have a personal uh schema, personal fear schema, but that fear schema is contextualized by the culture in which you've grown up. So your personal fear schema is underneath the kind of cultural um, uh, schema. Uh, And so, and that can be subcultural and sub-subcultural on down to the family um, and the siblings and so forth. You know, parents and siblings, your parents and your siblings will have different Called, um, different schema, um, despite the fact that you're living in the same family and you will be different from your siblings, but you'll be more similar to your siblings than to your parents, probably. I'm just making that up, but you know, the, there's a lot of differences between individuals uh, at every level of social organization. Um, and the more complex the social organization, the greater the differences. So, you know, you were asking about what a therapist does with this information. Well, you know, one of the papers that we published uh, uh, recently, some of the same folks that were in the uh, the uh, paper that came out today that you asked about earlier, um, is called "Putting the Mental Back into Mental Disorders," and that that paper is all about the the kind of uh, marginalization that subjective experience has had in the therapeutic community. Now, why is that? Well, this is my theory. The, um, in the 1950s, when the psychopharmaceutical industry was coming along and behavior therapy was beginning to be developed, um, the people involved in those two enterprises wanted nothing more than to put Freud in their rearview mirror, right? Because the, they wanted to be scientific and the, the antithesis of Freud. So by dismissing everything subjective, because Freud was all about subjectivity and you know the personal experience, by dismissing everything subjective, they turned to objectified responses, the psychopharmaceutical, put animals into test situations, uh, give them a drug that um, makes them behave less responsively, they're less timid, for example, or less avoidant. Therefore, uh, because the assumption is that we've inherited our fear centers from these animals, um, because they are less timid in that situation, it's because they are less fearful. And that's why we are fearful, is because we've inherited those circuits from them. And therefore, if, if we make animals less timid, giving the drug to a human should make the human less timid. But we know that the drugs are not really working so well, that the um, and the, op- the obvious explanation is you can't find a problem, if you can't find a solution to the problem of making people feel subjectively less fearful or anxious by studying it in rats, because that's not what you can study in rats. You can study behavior and physiology, and you can use those drugs perhaps to better control behavior and physiology, but ultimately it's got to be between the therapist and the patient, kind of mano mano, mano womano, however you want to put that. Yes, yes. Womano mano. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Yeah, so it's got to be, There's. it's the human element that has to be solved. And with insurance companies, you know, even CBT started out 
kind of adding cognition and, and beliefs and all of that. But I think over the years, my, the, the CBT therapists that I know well have told me that that has sort of dropped out a bit as well with the insurance and the age of insurance where everything has to be a metric, an objective metric. And that's not what's going to make the patient better. The patient has got to feel better. And unless you can deal with that, you aren't going to have a successful therapy, right? Yeah. I, I mean, in, in the world of uh, encoding, when we talk about encoding memories, we talk about the neuroscience. Uh, one of the reasons that uh, Ernest Rossi, my mentor, and, and now Matt and I, we've got a whole chapter in our new book uh, on genetics uh, to take you back to epigenetics which is an encoding of your personal experience, of the subjective experience. Right. And I, what, we're, what we're suggesting here, if, if I'm getting it uh, correctly, is that what we are doing on our emotional expressions, they are <laughs> coming from the encoding that is occurring in our memory, um, which is then backed up right through the body, right back to the, even right back to the epigenetics. And then we can go back even further, back to cellular behavior. Uh, John Leaf, we were talking to him, Dr. John Leaf the other day, talking about the interactions there. So this whole of body uh, engagement that is quite individual in its, in its expression, but has common systems. That's one of the things you've talked about, to be aware of this common system, like the common danger. So looking for this commonality. Uh, and if I could direct you now, just on that sort of thinking, we deal, of course, with this, these affective disorders, depression, uh, anxiety. Um, what, what mix do we, can we talk about there in relation to behaviorism, uh, sort of innate responses, emotional um, uh, additions, self-additions? What can we talk about yeah. in relation to those things? Well, you know, there's a lot of research that, you know, that it's starting to come out now that um, has not really, you know, it, it wasn't really making sense uh, for a long time, but that, you know, in depression, anxiety, and, and certain other conditions, there are these dissociations or this kind of uh, discordance between responses. So a person can be hyper aroused, but not very anxious, or very anxious and not hyper aroused. Mm -hmm. um, or it can be avoidant, but not that anxious because avoidance is a way to like, you know, reduce anxiety, right? Um, so the, um, <clears throat> the fact that these, these objective responses diverge from the, the more subjective events that, that, that are causing the subjective distress um, means that we can't use these behavioral and physiological indicators to tell us when the person is really feeling better. We have to address that with the person. Uh, and, you know, it's not like going to a, a medical doctor and, you know, you say, well, I have a pain right here in my arm. And the doctor says, well, that's not, that's not where the pain is. The pain is coming from your neck, right? Uh, and and so that idea is why subjective experience is marginalized in psychology and psychotherapy, and so forth, because uh, it's we've used the medical model so much as the, the gold standard, the template for understanding how to treat people. And I think that's wrong. Yes, I mean the 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 uh, when you think in systems, uh, of course, emergent uh, expressions, the, the sort of, uh, well, the phenotype, as we talk about with genetics, all, all these different things, the pain in the arm, uh, well, there's only Rossi called it the symptom path to enlightenment, which is that it's actually in the neck. Uh -huh. uh, but it's, it's fantastic. So is it that those emotions are telling you a nature of their encoded state of experience? Oh, uh, yes. What and you can use. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's, that's really right. This idea of the, the conscious experience that we have, which we can report on, is there a, just a couple of uh, things you can say? Cause I know it's still, it's a discussion that will go on for a, a million years. Yeah. Who knows. <clears throat> when we're talking about this conscious and this non-conscious, or uh, unfortunately we're still using subconscious with, uh, with a, a great deal of inaccuracy. Yeah. Yeah. What does, <clears throat> delineate the two and how can the two engage with each other or what the, from a therapeutic point of view? Well, let's, let's start with, you know, let's say an explicit conscious experience, every conscious experience until the last microsecond before it's conscious 
is pre-conscious. Right. So there's a lot of cognitive processing that's you know building up. It's not really building up, but it's you know it's it's going into behavioral control. It's doing all kinds of stuff, and then some of that will actually you know spin off and and become conscious. For some, it has to have a reason though, because of the energy demands of creating a conscious experience. There has to be a justification for kicking in a conscious mental model. Um, and so prior to consciousness, there's this trail of, of non-conscious information processing. So we just call that pre-conscious. And uh, you know, Freud, that, Freud's pre-conscious was kind of like that, right? It's stuff that can be conscious if you attend to it, but isn't necessarily conscious, right? So, but then there is, you know, more non-conscious or unconscious, depending on how you, I, I don't like to use unconscious because again, that goes to Freud so yes, automatically, um, but we can call it non-conscious. So all of the, those deep learning systems that I was talking about, all of the habits, all of the automatic responses we have, these are all just, you know, they don't have the connectivity to make it into cognition and consciousness. And it, they don't need to be there. Habits work perfectly fine in causing you to reflexively respond to a, a stimulus situation that you've learned about and repeated often. So there's good habits and bad habits, of course, but habits are, you know, you don't need a lot of energy. You just do it and you're okay. Um, if it's a bad habit, you know, again, it, you, you're doing it and you're okay, but it's because you may like taking the drug or having the drink if you drink too much, but it's what you want. And so you don't pay, you don't like dismiss it, but you might think about the bad habit and say, okay, well, I got to cognitively change that. But that's really hard to do, right? Because it's made to be automatic because that was the evolutionary advantage of a habit. You don't have to think about it. You just do it. Um, so reflexes, habits, uh, Pavlovian conditioning, all of that automatic stuff in the brain. We can call that like our mere neurobiological way of existing. And then on top of that, or in, interdigitated with that, is our cognitive way of existing, uh, which allows us to create mental models and make predictions about the world. That's more demanding than the the uh, neurobiological way of existing, but less demanding than the conscious way of existing. So you need a lot of energy. And there's got to be a reason for each step of going from automatic to cognitive and from cognitive to conscious. So, you know, and a patient is a lot of the stuff that a patient is thinking about and, you know, maybe even controlling the patient's behavior uh, is going to be part of the pre-conscious that doesn't make it into consciousness. Right. So and that is kind of a kind of, uh, you know, the therapist and the patient are communicating in a kind of implicit body language, you know, subtle, you know, there's that going on. And then there's the conscious talk. And both are important, right, because the conscious part can tell you what the patient believes is important and what they believe is important is really important to them. Right. Because that's their belief. Um, but you might get clues from the pre-conscious as well in terms of how the behavior, how the person is fidgeting. I guess that would be more un, you know, unconscious of fidgeting and stuff. But the, you know, the stuff that is kind of being expressed that it, the patient isn't talking about, but is kind of more is still intentional, kind of deliberative, but pre-conscious rather than conscious may be, you know, especially useful uh, in addition to the conscious part. But the conscious part is ultimately where the patient is going to have to feel better right that is where the the res the conclusion of the process is i feel better and you know you might you know if you if you don't feel better consciously it's still going to be kind of an itch that you need to scratch and you know i'm saying all this stuff about therapy and you know human disorders i I have no business talking about this. I'm, I'm not a therapist, a psychiatrist, psychologist, anything like that. No, um, I, no, just a I neuroscientist. It's all about the brain and what I know about the brain. So that's yeah. where I'm coming from. No, but I really appreciate uh, you, you responding to the framework. And and I, 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 I've pushed you in there. But actually, your answers are just applying the knowledge to human behavior. Because you may not be a therapist, but actually, you kind of are but you just haven't got the tag. You're, you're a great human being and you're very sensitive. Uh, we see the musical instruments behind you. you know, you're engaged with this, 
this uh, human expression, this sense of expression. And so there's some beautiful stuff in there. I mean, you were talking there about looking at all the, the fidgets and the digits and the things that are going on. No, they're terribly important and as, uh, because they are telling you things, bits of information as well. But I love that last bit you're saying is that essentially it does come down to having that conscious awareness. And there are a couple of things that uh, I, I learned over the years. Uh, consciousness, you're, you're able to be self-reflective and you're able to self-direct. So that word self comes in uh, to the point, which is, as you've talked about, is that 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 person that we know because of the in, uh, over time collection of experiences mm -hmm. and that beautiful sort of rounding out there that you don't need to not only just know that you're feeling better you need to know you know and that's what the species is we're homo sapiens to know the species homo sapiens sapien the species that knows it knows well so put. Uh, yeah and which is, of course, now we sort of circle a little bit back there and we, we're sort of more or less coming to the end of things, so we won't get into it. But of course, the, the, your other wonderful book, of um, the, which has got the great long title, which I've now forgotten, The, um, the, the, the Deep History of Ourselves, The, the Four Billion Year of Story of How We Got Conscious Brains. <laughs> yeah, you can see why I forgot that. No, but The Deep <laughs> History of Ourselves, where you do go through right from the very beginning giving us a sense of this understanding. And it's, it's, it's just, you know, I mean, it's one of those books that I've got with a, you know, 40,000 um, tabs in it to say, this is an important <laughs> page. Uh, so as, as we go through, and I think that's, uh, you know, thank you for saying well put because, you know, just brought together, you know, your approach and my approach, but they're, okay. they're, they're, they're both the same thing. In looking at, uh, at where we're going forward with this, I know, you know, my view of emotions is that they are these um, narrative driven, cognitive, culturally constrained uh, experiences that we have in a biological or psych biologically or psychologically significant situation. So for me, it's all about the what cognition does is it spins this narrative into our conscious experiences. Um, and this is this narrative is essentially what we know of as ourself, right? We kind of have this self-narrative. You know, we have that little voice running all the time, but that's not really what I'm talking about. I'm talking about an unconscious set of processes that come out of cognitive cognition to spin an abstract linguistic code. It's not, a, it's not in a, any particular language. It's what's sometimes called mentalese, uh, at least that's how I'm viewing it, a kind of abstract code that can take any kind of information in the brain, whether it's linguistic, visual, auditory, olfactory, memories, perceptions, and just turn those into a summarized code of what is all happening and feed that into our uh whatever is making our conscious experience. Uh, so our conscious experience is a readout of that narrative. Uh, and that is yourself. I mean, sometimes you hear about self as an agent within you that's, that's doing something. But there is no agent other than you that is doing something. You might, you're narrating yourself all the time. And that is the self you know, and you can use it to go back to your past and to predict your future and so forth. But it is not a separate thing. You know, we objectify, we reify the self, but the self is not a thing. It's, it's just a way we talk about what's on our mind and, and how else do we refer to what's in our mind? That's, that's my mind. That's myself. This is me. Um, so, you know, I think, um, you know, a lot, as I, you know, my, given that I've been working on all this stuff for, for decades, you know, I have certain opinions that don't necessarily go, you know, with the kind of status quo in the field. But, you know, when you get to a certain age, you can kind of shoot your mouth off and You're you know, welcome. see a different perspective. <laughs> yeah. And, and this just sort of wrapping up in, in, in my mind, this powerful comment there that the self like everything else, like mind, like consciousness, like non-consciousness, are all part of uh, a, a collective part of a system. And we can differentiate those elements. And we're just, it's not about objectivizing and 
disconnecting and separating right. those elements. You really can't separate them. You can talk about them with distinction, but to separate them and give them different um, uh, deification is, you know, right. almost as you were saying, is yeah. such a powerful thing. And what we're talking about, Matt and I, is the 21st century therapist needs to have a grasp of this stuff. Yeah. They don't have to become Joseph Ledoux, but they need to listen to Joseph Ledoux and <laughs> take out of it. God help them. God help them. Well, I've, been listening to for, I've been listening to it for years. Is there a last thought of uh, what's possible? Well, you know, our, the, anything is possible, but we have to make it possible by not destroying the planet in the process because you know, we're not going to survive long as a species if we continue in the direction that, that we're going now. I mean, that's just my opinion, obviously. But, you know, our conscious minds have taken us a long way through evolution and gotten us, you know, to done some amazing stuff, built buildings. And, you know, you have to have a conception that you're going to build a building and you then have to be able to figure out how to do it and create music and literature and art and all the wonderful things that um, that we can do as a species. But we're also like really challenging the ability of the planet to support our kind of life form. You know, when the when there was a climactic event, uh, I don't know, whenever it was, back when the dinosaurs became extinct, mm. um, the, the reason they became extinct was because they were the large energy guzzling organisms. And we're the big energy guzzling organisms now, right? We're not mm. as large as they were, but we probably use even more energy than they do. And so when that happens, the environment changes and it, it can't support all of the stuff that it was supporting. So the dinosaurs couldn't get food, but the little tiny mammals that were alive then could get by on much less energy. So they were able to find enough to survive and become like the top of the food chain. Uh, and the dinosaurs are gone. And so we're at the top of the food chain, but you know, will we, uh, will we make it or will you know, some other little creature come along and rise above us? You know, we know the bacteria will make it because they've been around for 3.7 billion years. Nothing's going to stop them. So they may just start the whole process all over. Fabulous. I think a, 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 a social conscious uh, sense of, of um, future, future wish is, uh, is great. And, and I think uh, when we talk about that future, it's like uh, today. <laughs> the future is now yeah <laughs> joseph ledoux thank you so much for always sharing. a pleasure richard anytime yeah beautiful okay